Hello, I'm Matthew Goldberg from the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, I'm on the uh, panel at the Western Economic Association International Conference, WEAI, on the All Volunteer Military Force, so called ABF. And uh, I'm one of four panelists. What I'd like to talk to you today in my segment is about the history of research that supported both the establishment of the All Volunteer Force and, and the sustainment of the All Volunteer Force, which has been going on at this point for uh, almost 50 years. So the All Volunteer Force, I consider a great achievement of economic analysis. There are many kinds of researchers and research disciplines, not just economics, uh, psychologists and statisticians and mathematicians and many others who contributed, but the impetus for the AVF was largely driven by economists. Uh, and I think the starting point for that is Milton Friedman, who's a very famous economist at University, University of Chicago. I missed him by a year as a grad student there, but I missed Professor Friedman. Uh, he testified to the Congress in 1967 that conscription is a tax. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, when you conscript people, um, they'll join the military uh, because they're, they get a letter saying you will be joining the military. And they're not necessarily paid a, a competitive or market wage that would otherwise induce them under free choice. And so the defense budget, in particular the military personnel budget is sort of artificially low because we're not paying, or at least our first term service members, a market wage. And that cost is actually borne by those conscriptees because of those draftees, if you want to call them, because um, they are, they are they're being forced into an occupation they would not have chosen, or at least would not have chosen at the wages that they are paid in the military. And so the military personnel budget looks low and conscription is really a tax on those who are conscripted. And uh, that was from Professor Freeman's argument, which I, I agree with and ultimately convinced a lot of skeptics. Um, at the same time, President Nixon, during the, uh, the, the Vietnam War, about a year after the peak in terms of having a half million service members on the ground in Vietnam, President Nixon was already contemplating moving to an all volunteer force and he impaneled the Gates Commission. Um, Gates was a former Secretary of Defense uh, uh, under uh, Tom, Thomas Gates under President Eisenhower, not to be confused with the more recent Robert Gates, who was uh, Secretary of Defense under President of, of Bush and Obama. Uh, the commission did its work between 69 and 70 and uh, came to the conclusion that we should move to an all volunteer force. Uh, in addition to Milton Friedman, one of the other important economists in this development was Walter Oy, whom I had the privilege of knowing a little bit towards the end of his life. He was an economist at University of Rochester and he's the first one to estimate the supply curve. So uh, how much would you have to pay recruits to voluntarily join the military in the numbers and importantly for later discussion inequality that, 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 that we wanted. And Walter Oy with very limited data under a different policy regime was able to estimate those debt supply curve for how much we'd have to pay recruits and correspondingly how much would we, would we have to fund the military personnel budget. Um, this was a, a resounding success in that the Congress chose not to reauthorize the draft after 1973 and thus we had the beginning of the old volunteer force. I might add that a lot of this early history is recounted very well in a book by Bernard Rosker, the Rand Corporation, uh, and a book that came out in 2006. And the name of the book, if I check for a moment, is I Want You, colon, The Evolution of the Old Volunteer Force by Bernie Rosker. There's a lot of this great, great history. Um, well, the early days of the ABF were rocky. I, I actually joined, joined the military uh, research community in 1980, coming from the University of Chicago. And uh, back then, the, so not quite the beginning, but close to the beginning of the ABF. Back then, they, people referred to the ABF experiment because a lot of people did not think and a lot of people, frankly, were hoping that the ABF would, would fail. And it almost did. And one reason is that the, there was a mistake in the implementation of the ABF. Again, this is in Rosker's book, but I'll, give, I'll recount it for you. Um, uh, people who want to join the military take the AFQT, the Armed Forces Qualification Test. And that test is normed relative to the general youth population in the US. So you get a percentile score saying that, for example, your, your score equates to the 60th percentile relative to the general youth population, not necessarily to those who join the military. It's normed to the broader population. Um, the military has categories one through five, in particular, they don't take any category five people, no cat fives. And there's a limit on the number of cat fours that the military would take. The current limit is 4%. So cat fours are those who score between the 10th and 20th, sorry, 10th and 30th percentile 
So it's a big slice of 20% of the civilian population. We only want to take four or 5% of those into the military. We want to undersample the people in the low end of the, of the uh, aptitude distribution. And the, um, the, the current limit is 4%. Back in the, early, in the, in the early, late 70s, that is in the early days of the AVF, the cap was 4%. But it turned out that this test was being misnormed. And uh, Dr. Bill Sims, who I got to know in my early days as CNA, Bill was a physicist. Most people who do testing science are psychologists, but he was a physicist. And he discovered in 1978 that the AFQT had been misnormed, whereas the goal was to take at most 5% of people in category four. The numbers were later found to be as high as 25%. The estimates varied, and the estimates were not only done by Bill Sims, but by Dr. Milton Meyer, whom I also got to know at Army Research Institute, and by ETS, which is the company that does the, the, the um, SAT. They also brought in its testing experts. And so the ABF almost failed because we accidentally took in too few people from the lower, uh, the lower ca aptitude category. And that was, that was fixed. Uh, one other thing that happened uh, in, that term, in that period was a so-called hollow force or hollow army. The term hollow army was actually coined by the army chief of staff, four-star general uh, Shai Meyer during the 1980 hearing of the House Armed Services Committee where he complained that the army for partly because of this problem that had just recently been identified in the process of being solved, too many cat four recruits. There were some other aspects of the hollow army. For example, the, the army was, was getting smaller after the war in Vietnam. They'd, they'd maintained all their divisions and division headquarters, but they had not fully manned uh, all those divisions. So we had units that were on paper that couldn't really go fight. And, and General Meyer acknowledged that before the Congress uh, attorney hearing. Also, the idea of getting, I mentioned earlier, of getting uh, people to sign up voluntarily, and not only that, but getting people in the higher aptitude categories to sign up, categories one through three. Um, military pay had not really kept up with inflation, and so it was not competitive with the civilian market, and that was largely remedied in the two large across-the-board pay raises to basic pay, which is the primary component of military pay. Um, a raise of 11.7% 11, 11 in 1980, and uh, 14.3% in 1981. In other words, cumulatively over those two years, military basic pay went up by 25%. And at that point, it was thought that military pay was finally competitive with civilian pay starting in 1982. So we got through the early days, we got through the late 70s. And uh, what about the role of econ research in general, but economists in particular? Uh, in in a support, not only in, in, in founding the in conceiving the idea of the ABF, Milton Friedman, Walter Oy, and others on the Gates Commission, but in sustaining the ABF. Well, there have been a lot of expert panels and commissions. Some of them are just irregular, not on any particular schedule or periodicity. But there is a, a particular uh, panel called the Quadrennial Review of Military Compensation, the QRMC, occurs, as the name suggests, about every four years, not exactly. Um, the first QRMC was actually um, reported out in 1967 before any thought of going to the volunteer force. It was more concerned with the management of the career force, that is people beyond their first term of service. But those proposals were overtaken by the complete restructuring uh, done by the Gates Commission. I'm gonna skip around here and only show you a few of the QRMCs. They've been 13. The fifth, jump ahead, the fifth in 1984, I actually had a very small role as a fledgling analyst on the um, fifth QRMC. The fifth is what led to the Redux Retirement Plan, um, which, which uh, re re reduced what had been the 50% retirement, uh, that's retirement at half pay after 20 years of service. Redux changed the parameters a little bit. It was later supplemented because of the cut in retirement. It was later supplemented by the $30,000 career status bonus to CSP in 2000, legislation in 2000. And all of that was finally overtaken in 2018 by the blended retirement system, which also came out of a QRMC, and I'll get to that. But pivotal changes in military retirement, which is basically the third rail of the compensation system. It's very hard to change. Two of those came out of QRMCs. The, um, the ninth, before we get there, the ninth QRMC reported out in 2002. I also had a small role in this, but the, probably the major contribution of the ninth was work done by <clears throat> Jim Hosek, and his colleagues at the Rand Corporation. And if you recall, I talked about, we want to take people from the higher aptitude categories. You don't want to take too many people from category four and nobody from category five. So you probably have to pay more 
than, than the median pay in the civilian world. The median pay might get you the average worker. We wanted above average workers in the military. And Jim Hosek and his colleagues, their work established that to get the quality as well as the quantity of people that the military required for its mission, you had to pay at the 70th percentile relative to comparably educated civilians. And that 70th percentile number has been revisited in subsequent secure MCAs and other research and pretty much confirmed that's the standard. Um, finally, I'll jump to the 12th Cure MC, which is also known as the MICRMIC, the Military Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission. There's a blue ribbon panel. The members of the panel included uh, some former members of Congress, a former Senator, uh, former, former DOD Comptroller, senior defense officials, uh, and other sort of dignitaries. But the, um, the staff director was Mr. Bob Daigle, and uh, the, the, the Micromic made a number of proposals on various aspects of military compensation, but the one that really stuck was, was become the blended retirement system, whereby service members not only uh, get retired pay after 20 more years of, of service, or earlier if they were disabled, but they also they made matching contributions to TSP, the Thrift Savings Plan. So there's a mix between the old-fashioned defined benefit program and a defined contribution program, which embodied in the TSP. And that came out of the 12th QMC as a superbly led commission by, by Bob Daigle. Um, so, and there have been many other commissions and panels over the years, but these, these, this is the, recurring, the major recurring panel, the QMC. Um, DOD has also relied on, on, on internal analysis shops. Each of the service branches has an analysis shop. Uh, they relied on the FFRDCs. I and mean, I'm representing IDA, also Rand and CNA are on this panel and they've worked for many years on the same kind of problems. And the, um, uh, the service academies, Naval Postgraduate School, some university partners, notably John Warner at Clemson University and some other people have all contributed to this, this work. Um, back in the eighties, when I was first active in this area, um, of course we used the econometric techniques that were available at the time and they've been superseded by better techniques, which I'll touch on at the end. Back then, we, 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 we ran reduced form, low distance probits, and even panel probits, and structural models, estimable dynamic programs. A lot of that work was pioneered by Glenn Gotts at Rand, the late Glenn Gotts, and his uh, professor from UCLA, um, John McCall, the late John McCall. I, uh, but the um, three, of us, three of us actually got PhD dissertations doing this, this kind of work. We're looking at the same, same uh, trenches. Um, Tom Dollar was an R of a, a very uh, a brilliant army officer. He was a, a, maybe a major when I met him. He was retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. He got his PhD on the Jerry Hausman at uh, MIT. And Glenn Gotts, who I mentioned, did his PhD under, under John McCall at UCLA. Um, Glenn is deceased. And I got my PhD under the late Sherwin Rosen, who was my professor at Chicago. Uh, the chronology here is a little bit off in the sense that this is when we got our PhDs based on work we were doing, but Glenn Gotts was actually kind of the first on the scene in the mid to late 70s, and I kind of joined in, and then Tom Dollar came later and just got his PhD very quickly. Um, later, I went on to be very successful on Wall Street, and I haven't heard from Tom in a while. I'm sure he's doing great. Um, the data, since those days, the data has improved and the methods have improved, so let me talk about that. Um, Defense Manpower Data Center, Center, DMDC, was originally conceived of as just as a warehouse of military personnel data. In fact, I remember getting on an airplane and visiting Monterey and seeing Robbie Brandaway, who directed the center, and pretty much their sole mission was a warehouse for personnel data. And they'd, they'd, we'd come up with specification, they'd send us a magnetic tape in those days, and we'd do our, do our work. Um, now DMDC has a much larger mission, though they still retain the, 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 the data mission that I just described. They run DEERS, the Defense Enrollment Eligibility Reporting System, DEERS. It's mostly known for establishing eligibility for military family members and retirees to get care at military treatment facilities, that's military hospitals. But those of us who have uh, our DOD badges and CAT cards, those are also managed by DMDC. Um, OPA, the Office of People Analytics, is, in another, is an internal analysis shop. Uh, it was founded in 2016. And it, it, it incorporates the longstanding Jammers, which is the, the, the survey, survey organization that provides the recruiters and all the service branches with intel on recruiting markets and potential recruits. Um, so they're also part of the analytic community. And uh, one of the things I'd like to mention is EDI, the Enterprise Data to Decisions Information Environment, so called EDI, 
Um, there were discussions between Mr. Mr. Abair, who is the Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Military Personnel Policy, a very important role for in the Pentagon for our community, and my Ida colleague, Dr. Julie Lockwood. Uh, and, and they, they, they noticed that many of us were doing similar work earnestly and collecting some of the same data. And they came up with the concept that what if we had a shared data environment, we could, we could have the same data, we could even curate the data and share curated data, though you might curate data differently depending on, the, on a particular research task and share tools and share findings to the extent that our respective sponsors uh, allowed us to, 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 to have that kind of sharing arrangement. And, and we had a big conference at IDA in, in, in 2018. It was funded by Mr. Abair and, and organized by my colleague, Dr. Lockwood. And that, that launched the, we had all the stakeholders I mentioned before, the other FFRDCs and the service reps and, um, and uh, people from the service academies, et cetera. And that, then we, we launched Eddie. Uh, the disposition of Eddie is that it's being folded into Advana. Advana stands for Advanced Analytics. When, when DOD had the big uh, audit of, of the, the audit of the entire DOD around 2018, <coughs> it was run by Mr. Norquist, who was the comptroller at the time and went on to be the uh, deputy secretary uh, before he retired from, from, from the government. Um, he, led it, he wanted to gather all, all the financial data in the department so as to facilitate the audit. And there was a large contract uh, with $500 million that went to Booz Allen to, to, um, to form Advana and Eddie will reside in Advana. And the concepts are still being worked out. Um, finally, I want to. I, I said that our data data have gotten much better, so we do a lot better analysis than Tom Dahl and Glenn Johnson and I did very earnestly in the '80s with what we had. Um, not only have the data gotten better, but the techniques have gotten much better. And now we're, we're in the world we're moving toward machine learning. Um, uh, the in in terms of 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 applying machine learning to to military personnel issues, I think it's fair to say that the FFRDCs, I and the other FFRDCs are in, are in the lead. Um, what does machine learning enable you to do? Well, we have much wider data sets. We have the, the service member's entire service record, pretty much, as distilled through DMDC. And <clears throat> there are a lot more characteristics, not only of the person at entry, but of his or her career, career progression, promotions, assignments, deployments, et cetera. That, can be used as predictors, for example, of how long someone will remain in the military. So much wider data sets than we could even accommodate if we had them using regression, loaded regression kind of methods. Um, another advantage of machine learning is that it's agnostic with respect to functional form. Um, the capture nonlinearities, some variable might have, say, a cubic effect or a quadratic effect. In the old days, we actually had to put those cubic or quadratic terms in the model by hand. And that's part of model selection is determining which, which of those terms belong there. And similarly, interactions, if we thought the effect of one variable depended on, on the value of another, we had to code in those interactions as product terms. <clears throat> but machine learning is, is designed to discover those kind of relationships without, the, without us having to um, hypothesize them in advance. So that's one advantage. Um, and so it makes better use of wide data and does it in, in sort of a, a non-parametric uh, non, non way. Um, in this, in this uh, 2021 WAAI session, there were five other five talks on ML me methods by Ida colleagues, and so and and I invite people listening to this talk as an overview to catch up and listen to those five other talks to find out how better data and machine learning methods have, have been used currently to solve the problems of Mr. Abair and other sp uh, sponsors in the in the, in the service branches who, who have these important multi-personnel issues to solve. Um, and I hope you find this informative and I thank you for listening.